Welcome to this edition of Clinical Clips, an accredited continuing education activity. This brief expert video will spotlight the daily hot topics from the conference. This is Dr. Richard Elian, Clinical Professor of Medicine at George Washington University School of Medicine. I'm at ID Week, and this is episode one of, of two episodes of Clinical Clips. The first study I'd like to talk about is suppressed switch to bictegravir amtricitabine tenofovir alafenamide versus dalyotegravir lamivudine done by Jerry Perone. The idea of this study was to compare people who were on a prior regimen and they were switching to BIC or DTG containing regimens with a viral load of less than 200 at the time of switch and compare the risk of confirmed virologic failure and compare the risk of discontinuation. This used the OPERA cohort, which is a large cohort with a, over 155,000 patients living with HIV. The bottom line for the clinical results were the risk of virologic failure was slightly uh, less with Bictegravir FTC TAF with a hazard ratio of 0.84, and the, uh, the risk of confirmed virologic failure was 1.04, so very similar between the two groups. The uh, risk of regimen discontinuation was uh, higher. For, uh, for DTG3TC with a lower rate of discontinuation seen with bictegravir containing regimen. The next study I'd like to talk about would be looking at real-world adherence and persistence with cabotegravir and ropivirine uh, compared to oral ART in USA, the above studies. And so this was a population who were stable on orals and then switching to injectables. The two populations had to be balanced so they could be uh, make relative comparisons. And for the most part, they were on similar oral regimens before they came in. And the bottom line in the adherence was that the adherence in the oral ART cohort was approximately 43% versus 72% for those on injections. Now, these numbers seem low, and they were from a claims database, which could uh, not accurately reflect the true adherence because it's reflecting what was paid for, but not necessarily what was taken. But the distinction between the two, it, it has been corroborated in previous studies with this database. Uh, the persistence between the two was significantly different with more, higher persistence on CAB RPV, although the number of days 274 to 256 is quite small. But the bottom line is we see that in, 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 in this sort of real world evidence of a claims database, the adherence was greater for injections than it was for oral albeit in the same group that reflected a desire to switch. So it's possible that the group that had lower adherence, oral had lower adherence because this was a group that wanted to switch versus we're looking at just real world adherence in a claims database versus adherence on injectables. Future studies will help elucidate this relationship. The next study I'd like to talk about looks at the use of CAB RPV injections for people who had detectable viral load uh, on entry. This is not the group that this regimen is on label for or was designed for initially, but it takes a look at this population that perhaps is at greater risk for viral, viral failure and looks at people who are already viremic and puts them onto injectables. This study uses the opera cohort, which we previously discussed, that has over 155,000 patients. Patients had to be greater than 18, be ART experienced, and have a viral load greater than 50 copies at first injections, and it was followed during the time from 2021 to 2023. The key findings from this study were that, first of all, 12% of the people entering this injectable therapy did so despite the recommendations of being on label. However, of those 12%, 82% were able to suppress their viremia down to viral load less than 50 on that regimen. Uh, what's interesting also is that this population looking at the greater than 200 still had some efficacy. The counterpoint to these findings was that the group of patients who came into this study had a high CD4 count. Previous studies by the group in San Francisco had looked at lower CD4 count for this innovative therapy. And so we're not really sure how to compare this success rate in these higher immunologic state patients versus patients perhaps who are failing who have lower CD4 counts. And more research will be necessary to elucidate that, that utilization.
A very interesting study was done by Amalia Aldridge on consequences of low-level viremia among women. There's a big debate in the guidelines what to do about viral loads that are under 200. So they looked at the persistence of, of low-level viremia, and they defined this as either intermittent or persistent. The anchor drugs were similar in the, in the groups that had blips. And what they found is that uh, 6% had persistent low-level viremia, and 18% had intermittent low-level viremia. And this translated into a higher risk of vir virologic failure for both the intermittent and persistent groups, but more importantly, translated into a higher risk of multimorbidity of development of diseases with a 1.64, uh, 1.61 hazard ratio in the adjusted rate for persistent with a lower uh, lower impact on the intermittent. Number one, the adherence and the success rate in women in this study was, was excellent and greater than seen in other studies. So kudos to the women in the WISE study for taking their medications. However, the risk of virologic failure and the consequences of under 200 were significant. And it, it, it posed the question as everyone listened to the talk about what to do about these patients, because less than 200, for the most part, we just encourage adherence. The question is, will less than 200 be a change in potentially in guidelines? And would we think about changing regimens before we see virologic failure? That's the current clinical question that this study poses. A very interesting study was done by Russell at, at Al, looking at a survey of patients to see what would be the optimal regimen as we see developments of new regimen. And what they found was that 24.7% indicated that an injection by a healthcare practitioner, not self-injection, but by a healthcare practitioner, every six months was the favorite, 24.7%. Second, by, favored by 23.5% was weekly oral pills, 22% a yearly implant, daily oral pills, 18%, and injection by a healthcare practitioner once every three months, 11.8%. And so this study really poses, I think, what the future should look like based on patient desires. We need to have regimens that are uh, much less frequent every six months, is, is considered desirable, but every it takes to get to every three months before it even becomes interesting enough for patients to see that as something they wish to do in the same equivalency, more or less, as daily oral medication. An interesting study as we consider switching patients onto two drug regimens that don't con contain hepatitis B medications is the risk of reactivation. Rachel Denyer and colleagues looking at the VA database looked at hep B reactivation in patients with a positive a hepatitis B core antibody after switching to antiretroviral therapy without hepatitis B activity. They looked at close to uh, 20,000 patients who were core antibody positive out of a group of 60,000 patients. So about uh, one third of the, of the people had this core antibody. And they had an incidence rate of about 1.5% of reactivation among those patients who switched to two drug regimen. Now, whether this 1.5% is enough that it calls into question, do we need to have core antibody testing at the time we switch to two drug therapy is an open question. But this, this finding that there is perhaps this sentinel sign of core antibody positive, and is that something that we should always measure in patients that we put on to two drug regimens is an interesting question that this study posed. Thank you so much for joining us for episode one. Please refer to the landing page for slides and be sure to come back tomorrow for our second episode from ID Week 2023. We hope you found this activity useful and educational. To receive continuing education credit and to download your printable certificate, please return to the activity webpage and click on the Claim Credit button associated with today's clinical clip.